bikes. Uh, since somebody mentioned bikes, let's talk about them a little bit. Um, this was one of the first really detailed costed initiatives that we put together. After the light rail package, we figured let's fill it in with something a little bit more lo-fi, but equally important. And we've got a uh, we've got a patchy cycling network here. I'll explain a little bit later why the focus and why the obsession on bikes, but for the time being, Bike Vision says, how do you take this patchy, degraded, neglected network, which is good in some parts of the city and, and pretty terrible or non-existent in others, and make it one of the best in the world for cyclists? What if instead of the private car being at the top of the planning hierarchy, we demoted it a couple of jumps, didn't abolish it, we're not abolishing the car. <laughs> we're not abolishing the car. Um, <laughs> But what if we put people at the top of the planning hierarchy? What if we put parents with kids at the top of the planning hierarchy and the elderly and the disabled at the top of the planning hierarchy? <laughs> and somewhere not at the exact top, but close to the top, we put cyclists. Um, that would be a good thing. Uh, if, we, if you were really serious about it, for a city that is now you know, basically 100 kilometres from end to end, Bike Vision said, let's make it the world's best for bikes. What would it cost? How long would it take? Could we actually do it? And the way the numbers ended up falling out was you need 3% of the state transport budget, you need local governments to basically just keep doing what they're doing, and you need a small fund, an $80 million fund, which is about that much of the Commonwealth budget, uh, and you could actually do it. By the year 2029, which is our target date for a lot of these ideas, you could have the world's best city for bikes. We crowdsourced it, so the white dots there, the blue lines here are your kind of bike freeways, the principal shed pass, this mesh, this broken mesh, is the, the cycling networks that we have. And the dots were reported to us by you. Um, this is still live, by the way. This is an app that you can download on your phone that will allow you to report something like that. What is this? <laughs> what is that for? You know, that is 60 metres of bike lane that spits you into a dangerous intersection just when you probably need it the most. So our <laughs> bike network shouldn't try to kill you. There are all these little broken fragments where someone some Wednesdays had a really good idea and thrown in 200 metres of track and then walked off and done something else. <laughs> um, fixing, fixing that up is really important. So the bike black spot allows you to arrive at a piece like this and kind of lol, and then you can take a photograph of it, your comment, and it'll send your snarky comment and the photograph and a pin on a Google map to Troy Buswell and me, which is tremendously satisfying. So please down. <laughs> please download that. We'll talk a little bit more about bikes later. We will. But let's first talk about bringing together at least these ingredients that we've established so far, the transit-oriented city and the planning hierarchy and the people, and what would happen if you actually did that for real, kind of contemplated the whole metropolis, the whole city from end to end as, a, as basically a single critter, a single metabolic structure that we all live in. And its purpose is to provide us with a good life without kicking the biophysical support out from underneath it and killing everybody. That sounds like a, a reasonable, um, excuse for a city. So you're starting again with a freight network, you've seen, you've seen this map before, meshing and lacing together the urban villages with fast, clean, convenient, rapid transport. Um, remembering always that this is an industrial city because sometimes we just forget that they're there, that not everybody works in the central business district. And the basic premise is you take these kind of void-like industrial strips filled with concrete big boxes and you roll people and the biosphere back into them. And you end up with somewhere between 94,000 and a quarter of a million dwellings. Because we don't all live in computer graphics, we modelled a few from street level. So it's Kent Street and Albany Highway. Not Hong Kong, not, not Tokyo style, although Tokyo is great. Five to eight storeys maximum, that's East Fremantle. Um, that's what it looks like. At ground level, childcare centres, libraries, bookshops, coffee shops, places to work, um, places to be in community, learn a language, meet, meet your neighbours. And above that, people, places to live. And above that, on the roof, gardens. Why not? It allows us to have a... <laughs> it allows us to have a much more intelligent conversation about housing. We've made it quite a big focus of this election campaign is affordable housing. Housing used to be, should be, and is a human right. 
And yet, in the last 15 or 20 years, it's been converted into just another asset class. You know, something to be shunted around like poker chips. We've become a nation of landlords and property investors and a nation of renters. And on the left-hand side of the page, you can see the story about people who are homeless and sleeping in doorways, uh, people who will never, ever be able to afford to buy their own home. And on the right-hand side of the page is a woohoo real estate, yippee, 10% uh, capital return on real estate investment. And we never seem to make the bridge and draw the connection between these two things, pulling in opposite directions. But it really is time we did something about it. Who, who remembers hearing during the global financial crisis that we built $6 billion worth of sh affordable social housing? You remember that? Because it wasn't a disaster, no one ever heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> because it worked. So this, we've just gone and done it for them. It's kind of what we're for. Spot these gaps and do the work. We've launched the better part, there's a few more components still to put on the table, the better part of a national housing affordability plan. Ending homelessness, there are 7,000 people at least, according to the census tonight, sleeping outside, sleeping rough, doorways, under cars, in parks, 7,000 people. So we worked out what it would cost to house all of them by 2020 and to double the support levels for specialist homelessness services. That's a finite amount of money. It's an amount you can calculate and then we should do that. We should just do that. We've announced a series of things that you see up there. I'll show you how you can find all this data a little bit later in the show. But taking a bit of the side of the renter just for a change, not just because I am one, maybe partly because I am one. That's a third of Australian householders are renters. And guess what? We might not all want the Australian dream. I'm not sure I want a four by two McMansion, 40 kilometres over the horizon, because I can't really afford the time or the expense of driving to where I work. So we need diverse and affordable housing and we need someone on the side of the renters. So that's what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. I'm actually really proud to see it coming together. We're working our way through halving the social housing waiting list and now increasing supply and creating some rights for tenants. Um, we have, although we haven't been joined or matched by any announcements yet, we've worked with some amazing people along the way. It's been quite humbling and it's something that we're gonna push pretty hard on in the next term. Another thing that is really interesting about housing and about space is that the census records, not that it's a very good measure, quite a high vacancy rate in the city, somewhere five, eight, ten percent vacancy, depending on the, on the city, on the community, of empty space. And Melbourne, where they've gone and mapped it according to utility bills, there's something in the order north of five percent vacant space in these big cities. While we have 7,000 people sleeping rough and 105,000 total homeless, We've got empty space. So watch this space. Watch spaces like that. We need to get them back into the affordable market. We need to get them back for commercial tenancies and we need to get them back for affordable uh, rentals. And so we've designed, or we haven't designed actually, we've shamelessly plagiarised a system that works very well in Canada and has been adopted in the UK called Convert to Rent. And it's how, just a little incentive to get these places back onto the market. So that's the old. What about the new? And this is something that we've been really interested to discover along the way. Watch as this eight-storey apartment block in Richmond in Melbourne gets built in 11 days. So these little modules are assembled in factories and then craned and lifted on site and then switched on and then people move in. And it's that simple. These modules that at the moment come in mostly in flat packs from China or assembled in yards in Melbourne or, or I think it's first one's just been established here in WA, very little building waste, very, very high energy and water efficient, uh, stacked, and when you're inside them, you don't know that they are prefabricated, fast build, modular. This, I think, is a very interesting direction to go in. If you can imagine closing one of those ecological loops that I put up on the wall just before, what if you plugged the housing affordability crisis in with these decline of the manufacturing sector, people being thrown out of the auto industry, and you plug that into timber towns in the southwest that are trying to work out how to avoid liquidating the last stocks of native vegetation. There's another industry there really waiting to happen when you think about it. We've got more than 80,000 hectares of pine plantations. Rather than bringing these things in impacts from China, why aren't we doing that here? Why not put that together here?
The stuff is fun, isn't it? Okay, so let's move on. For every hectare that you, that you go down that track, so here's a hectare at R10, 10 dwellings per hectare, 100 metres on a side. Um, R15 is what you just saw go there. That's the state's infill target, not good enough. That buys you that sprawl all the way down the Swan Coastal Plain. Now, that was our maximum density scenario in the Transforming Perth study. For every hectare you do that to, you free up 16, 16 hectares of peri-urban bushland or farmland for horticulture or Carnaby's cockatoos, 16 to 1. Now, you don't have to do that to the whole city. The beauty of these studies, the one that they did in Melbourne, 93% of the urban footprint's untouched. You haven't abolished... We already agreed that we're not abolishing cars. We're also not abolishing suburbia. What you're doing is re-threading public transport and medium and high density back into it. But 16 to 1, that's how we stop the sprawl. That's how we halt that sort of ceaseless expansion that I put up at the, at the front. So the Perth Greenways project is about having done those things. Here's how we don't necessarily need to fight over Underwood Avenue anymore. Here's how we don't have to put ourselves in front of bulldozers when they try and put four lanes of dopey tarmac through the Belia wetlands. Or the people at Point Perrin who are trying to stop that mad marina from going in. We don't need to do these kind of things anymore. Greenway says, well, what if we, having halted this remorseless sprawl, uh, what if we restored and rebuilt the biodiversity that we have here? In the age of climate change, there's nothing more important than that connectivity so that pollinators and critters can move from place to place with this kind of chopped up fabric that you see here. That's kind of what's left. Ironically enough, they called it uh, bush forever. And there's bits of it that are gone that weren't as forever as we thought. If you take that as the basis of working back from these biodiverse islands, remap the water, the wetlands, and the functioning land that the city stands astride, um, and then reweave. This is really beautiful work that Walga have done, the, um, the Biodiver Perth Biodiversity Project. If you live here, maybe a voucher for $50 drops in your letterbox one day and you can go to your local native nursery, speak to someone who knows the language and the six seasons that prevail here and put something in your backyard that belongs and won't, be, won't necessarily need to be watered every 20 minutes in summer and actually reweave the biodiversity back into the Swan Coastal Plain.